waiting to greet Colonel Ralston at an English airport are the Honorable Vincent Massey, Generals Montague and Stewart, and senior public relations officers. Canada's defense minister has been visiting Canadians in various parts of the Italian front. Back in England for a brief stop, he chats a moment before leaving the field with the Honorable Vincent Massey and other officers there to greet him. A short stay in England and then over to Belgium where he gets a first-hand account of Canadian activity. At a Canadian general hospital, Colonel Ralston chats with many Canadians who were wounded in the savage fighting along the coast and are now receiving the best of medical care to restore them to health. Leaving the hospital, he says goodbye to the officer commanding, Colonel Hume, Major M. M. McLaren, Principal Matron, and others of the staff. The Defense Minister inspects troops in Belgium. He interviews many soldiers and learns a lot about the part our men are playing in that grim continental battle. King George steps from a plane in Belgium for the investiture of senior Canadian Army leaders. He is greeted by Lieutenant General Guy Simmons and other officers. Shortly afterwards, he enters the open-air square where the ceremony is held. With the King is Field Marshal Montgomery. The King makes General Simmons the commander of the band. Major General D.C. Spry of Halifax receives the DSO. Other recipients of the King's Honours include Brigadier H.B.D. Lang of Halifax, Brigadier J.A.W. Bennett, Ottawa, and Brigadier C. Fenwick, Toronto. All three receive the CBE. The Order of the British Empire is awarded to Brigadier W.G.H. Rope of Vancouver and to Brigadier J.G. Sprague of Toronto, who also wins the DSO. A chat with the guard commander is followed by an inspection of the Guard of Honor before leaving Investiture Square with Prince Charles, Regent of Belgium. Canadians line the road as he departs and cheer enthusiastically at the close of the historic ceremony held on ground hard won by the Allies a short time before. Wartime demands for pulpwood speed British Columbia's logging industry. The men in the forests of the Pacific Coast have been able to speed up operations by 300% through the use of new high-speed power saws. What used to take two hours by two men with two axes now takes five minutes. still has its place though. An undercut is chopped to control where the tree will fall. And the handle inserted in the cut indicates the approximate direction. The Germans were the first to use power saws. In the last war, they introduced them as a secret weapon, felling trees to block allied advances. handle the big logs with ease, snaking them out of the woods to trucks which carry them to the river many miles away. Boom experts pull them into booms. Tugs haul the giant boom, sometimes a quarter of a mile long, to the pulp mill. Pullers have to be as sure-footed as cats. Many of them can't even swim. It's a tricky business, and the loggers have to be literally on their toes. At the mill, the logs are sorted and pulled to the jack ladder. Among the great mills on Canada's west coast, is one of the largest in the world. A year's production provides enough timber to build all the houses in a city the size of Regina or Guelph.
line of wood has its special uses. More Sitka spruce for mosquito flames is produced there than at any other plant in the world. And 200,000 tons of newsprint this year for democracy's free press. Canadian light tanks and vehicles gather near Rimini on the Adriatic. At zero hour, they get underway and move down an Italian road, heading for the front, where our guns command an important enemy position across the valley. Data comes down from the old ship. 25-pounders bark and 3.7-ack ack guns are brought into play against ground targets as the barrage gets underway. is temporarily halted. But elsewhere, they go on. Not fast in the gumbo, but they do get through. Even tanks get into difficulty, and it looks as if cooperation will be needed. Another tank is detoured around, and a cable is passed back to the helpless vehicle and made fast. Mud and rain they keep on, and tanks enter a wrecked village to be followed by lighter military traffic. Before clearing out, the Germans destroyed their guns, and the working days of a great quantity of enemy equipment are over. Guns and concrete emplacements are shattered objects of interest to the inhabitants of another captured Italian town. vehicles are on the move again in Belgium to be greeted enthusiastically by the citizens of another liberated town. Troop-laden trucks move in along the canal bank. An enemy armored train was blown up by the Germans before they left. Mounting an 11-inch piece, it was abandoned right on the border near the Noisen Canal. Now it's only a train load of scrap. Men of the Royal Canadian Engineers build a pontoon bridge to take armored vehicles over to the pocket. Working under extreme difficulties, they push the bridge across in record time. Under the watchful eyes of a friend section, the bridge is completed. A protective smoke screen is laid by a unit of the British Pioneer Corps. The move is underway, and our troops and vehicles set out across the estuary into the Skelt Pocket. Beyond the flooded area is the target, and a rocket-carrying typhoon dives on the position. Not content with rockets alone, the tippy pilots swing in again after their first dives to machine gun the blasted position. along the road beside the hedgerow, ready to deal with any survivors. 
over the border, and our transport never pauses. They are followed by the 25-pounders and more trucks, pushing on, pursuing the enemy with steady, relentless pressure, clearing him from the scalp pockets. 